Alleluia, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, Alleluia. Hello and welcome to this service from the Chapels Royal, Her Majesty's Tower of London, for this Sunday, the 25th of April, 2021, the third Sunday after Easter. We hope that this finds you still well and safe. We are delighted that you've chosen to join us in worship today, wherever you may be. Sir David Suchet will read for us from St John's Gospel, after which we shall, in keeping with the Collect, for this day reflect a little on our need to reject error and to walk in the light of God's truth. First, we pray that Collect from the Book of Common Prayer set for this day. Almighty God, who showest to them that be in error the light of thy truth, to the intent that they may return into the way of righteousness, Grant unto all them that are admitted into the fellowship of Christ's religion, that they may eschew those things that are contrary to their profession, and follow all such things as are agreeable to the same. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The New Testament reading for today, the third Sunday in Easter, is taken from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verses 11 to 18. Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus. And carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. This is the Gospel of Christ. It must be said at once that the passage that we heard just now from St John's Gospel is, to say the least, controversial. I don't mean that it's controversial in terms of its authenticity, but it is a text which has been at the heart of much dispute down the ages. To be precise, it has been, with similar texts from other Gospels, at the heart of much anti-Semitism. People have taken it as a kind of proof text that Jews as a people, and I stress that phrase, Jews as a people, were and are to this day responsible for the crucifixion of Jesus. There we have, in black and white, in the gospel, people calling for the crucifixion of Jesus in spite of Pilate having sought to release him. Now two things are immediately obvious. Firstly, only those present on that day who called for the crucifixion of Jesus could in any way be regarded as responsible for making a collective call for that crucifixion. Secondly, even if we did choose to make such an attribution of collective guilt against that particular group of people at that particular moment, it could in no way justify prejudice against successor generations. Let's take a, another example, which by cruel irony also involves the Jewish people. We are all too aware of the crimes committed by Germany under the Nazi regime, but it would be utterly illogical and unreasonable to accuse those Germans born since 1945 as in any way culpable of those terrible events, much less Germans born hundreds of years hence. Let's show some consistency here. 
But there's something else about this gospel passage and about the whole Gospel of John, which I think it is important for us to consider. We must always bear in mind that when we are reading the Bible, we are reading a translation. What is more, words may have been used differently by the writers from the way in which we read them today. So I think it's worth bearing in mind that there continues to be debate amongst biblical scholars as to what the word Jews means in the Gospel of John. The Gospel seems to have been written in Ephesus by a Jewish writer who was part of the diaspora, that is, the many Jewish communities who lived around the Mediterranean. Some of the members of the diaspora might have visited what we now call the Holy Land, but most may not. They maintained their religious and cultural traditions, but felt at a distance from those who lived back in the historic lands of Israel. There is a broad scholarly consensus that the Gospel of John was addressed partly, directly, to other Jewish believers in Ephesus and elsewhere in the diaspora who did not accept that Jesus was the Messiah. But the writer nowhere says, you Jews did this or that. He writes to his own audience about the Jews as another group, even though his audience are themselves Jews. So writing some 70 or so years after the crucifixion, the writer of John's Gospel is addressing fellow diaspora Jews about the past actions on one occasion of a group of other Jewish people across the sea, most of whom would logically already be dead. He's talking already about something that happened in an earlier generation. There's another point worth thinking about, which is that the Greek word eudaioi used in the gospel has more than one meaning. Its basic meaning is people from Judea. People from Judea, that is people who are not from Galilee. Jews, yes, but not Galileans. So John himself can be seen as focusing on events involving a subsection of a subsection of the Jewish people in a far off place and in an earlier generation. We can therefore see that there is no justification in this gospel passage as if there could ever be any justification for pinning collective guilt on a whole people today for events which happened 2000 years ago. Now this may be blindingly obvious, but it needs saying again in every generation. A final thought. We British like to think of ourselves as fair-minded and possibly immune from accusations of collective and historic guilt. The ever-growing and entirely proper attention being given to the extent to which this country engaged in, profited from, promoted and protected the slave trade demonstrates how careful we must be in claiming the moral high ground. The racism, which in its own perverted way justified the slave trade and the very idea that human beings could own other human beings is a lot closer to our own day than we like to admit. Indeed, there is a lively current debate as to the extent to which racism still pervades our society. But let us suppose that we could simply assign white Britain's involvement in slavery to the history books and attribute it to the errors of our forebears. How would we, white British, then feel if we, as a group today, were collectively and indiscriminately damned by others today as irredeemably wicked today because of the actions of those forebears? Would we think it fair? Would we think it acceptable? I rather suspect not. But I also think we're going to have to get used to what it feels like to be on the receiving end of such sentiments. And who knows? It might do us all some good. And now let us pray. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We pray for Archbishop Justin of Canterbury, for Bishop Sarah, Dean of the Chapels Royal, and for all who lead and who minister in the church throughout the world, upholding the gospel values of peace, justice, truth, and reconciliation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer.
We pray for all the royal family. We pray especially at this time for Her Majesty the Queen, who has just celebrated her birthday without her beloved companion of more than seven decades. We pray for all in positions of authority under her, whether local or national, that they might act selflessly, impartially, and for the common good, especially in this time of trial. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the constable, the governor, the chief yeoman warder, the chaplain, and all who live and work in the Tower of London, especially as we look forward to the reopening of the Tower to the public in May. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our society, and we pray that we might always strive for truth and justice. We ask you to give us wisdom in reading the scriptures and in challenging our own prejudices so that we might never fall into the error of discriminating against our neighbours. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who are sick in body, mind or spirit, and we name here Isabel, Rory, Lucy, Judy, Neil, Heather, Fiona, Pat, Lorraine, and Ben. And we pray for all others known to us or for whom we have been asked to pray. We pray also for those who minister to them and for all in the medical and caring professions, giving thanks for their loving kindness. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who have died recently, amongst whom we name his late Royal Highness Prince Philip, Duke of Edinburgh, Baroness Shirley Williams, Joe Allred, and Helen McCrory. We pray especially for any who have died unexpectedly, including all those who have died from the coronavirus. We pray that all those who mourn may be comforted. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We offer here our own prayer in time of the coronavirus. God of love, we ask for your blessing on those who are ill, those who are vulnerable, those who are worried about themselves, and those they love, and on those who mourn. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And we bring together our prayers in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. The Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, teach you to walk in his way more trustfully, to accept his truth more faithfully, and to share in his life more lovingly, that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may come as one family to the kingdom of the Father. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia.
Please.